Okay, this is the second lesson in the Physical Behavior of Matter Unit, Unit 6. Today we're going to differentiate between exothermic and endothermic reactions. We've done this in different units, but we'll review the concept. We're going to identify phase changes and understand how to read a heating or cooling curve. We're going to recall the definition of heat and understand how it varies from temperature. So let's start with that last objective now. In our last lesson, we defined temperature as a measure of the average kinetic energy of particles in a substance. So when temperature changes, average kinetic energy changes. When temperature increases, average kinetic energy increases. And when temperature decreases, average kinetic energy decreases. This is said to be a direct relationship. Heat, on the other hand, Heat is energy that is measured as it's transferred from a body at a higher temperature to a body at a lower temperature. Imagine that you go to sleep at night and you don't move. And you wake up in the morning and you have a stiff neck. You might reach for a hot pack to put on your neck to loosen up the muscles. The hot pack is hotter than your neck and therefore the heat is transferred from the hot pack to your neck and to a point where your neck will become very warm and the hot pack will become cooler. We're going to start on page 6 and we're going to review the additional questions to ponder. In the first question we're dealing with different masses of copper and iron so we have two different um, sample types of different masses but they're at the same temperature and the question is asking us to compare the average kinetic energy of the copper atoms to the iron atoms and explain our choice. Well, as we just said, temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of particles. So if the particles, regardless of what they are, are at the same temperature, then they have the same kinetic energy. I'm going to abbreviate kinetic energy Ke for kinetic energy and potential energy I will abbreviate as Pe. In the next question it says a student is examining two samples of ice so we have the same substance except for we have 10 grams of sample A and 1 gram of sample B. They're both at their freezing point. Well if they're both ice then they're both at zero degrees Celsius because that is the freezing point of water and they want us to compare and contrast the samples in terms of temperature. Well they both are the same so same sample in this case water which is ice at zero degrees Celsius is going to be the same temperature because regardless of how much I have of a sample it doesn't matter whether I have 10 grams of ice or one gram of ice they're both going to have the same freezing and melting point and heat energy well heat energy is energy that is measured as energy moves from a um, sample at a higher temperature to a sample at a lower temperature. So they're at the same temperature. So since temp temperature isn't changing, they would have the same heat energy at this point because the temperature is the same. Once we move one of the samples somewhere else, then the heat energy will change. Question 3. For the following scenarios, please indicate whether the average kinetic energy of water molecules is increasing, decreasing, or remaining the same. Now remember, average kinetic energy is directly related to changes in temperature. So I have water solid changes to water liquid at 0 degrees Celsius. Is my temperature changing? No, it is not. Therefore, my kinetic energy is the same. Kinetic energy is the same. In the next question, 
I'm going from water liquid to water solid at zero degrees Celsius. My temperature is not changing. Therefore, my kinetic energy is not changing. It is the same. Kinetic energy only changes when temperature changes. In this next question, we have water liquid at 10 degrees going to water liquid at 20 degrees. So I'm going from 10 degrees to 20 degrees. I'm increasing in temperature, therefore my kinetic energy will increase. I also have water at 20 degrees in the last question going to water at 10 degrees. That is a decrease in temperature. If temperature is decreasing, then my kinetic energy will decrease. Next question. When the temperature of an object changes by 100 degrees Celsius, how much does it change in Kelvin? Well, the answer is 100 degrees. Why? Because we were learned in our last lesson that a change of 1 degree Celsius is equal to a change of 1 Kelvin. So even though they're two different temperature scales, the increments are the same. And question five, what are the two fixed points on the thermometer? Please state the names and temperature values for both. Well, if we're looking at the Celsius scale, then my two fixed points would be 100 degrees Celsius which is the boiling point, BP, and zero degrees Celsius, which is the freezing point. And on the Kelvin scale, this would match up to 373 Kelvin at the, for the boiling point and 273 Kelvin for the freezing point. Okay, I guess I'm missing two questions, so we'll just kind of... Okay, question six says, when you look at a solid, it does not seem to be moving at all. Since the particles are not at absolute zero, explain how it is possible for the particles to be moving. Well, in a solid, particles are packed very close together and they basically vibrate in place. So because the particles are packed so close together there really isn't much room for them to move back and forth. Therefore they just bounce kind of off one another so they're vibrating. And the last question, a temperature probe in a plant reads negative uh, 298 degrees Celsius. Is this temperature possible? And explain. Well, we know that on the Celsius scale that absolute zero is negative 273 Celsius. 270, negative 273 Celsius is absolute zero all motion stops at this point. So no, this temperature reading of negative 298 is not possible. Okay, let's move on to phases of matter. Phases of matter should be a review from 8th grade, and we've also talked about it in other units. Matter exists in three forms at standard temperature and pressure. This is referred to as STP. STP. These values can be found on the front of your region's chemistry reference tables. 
So what is standard temperature and pressure? Just to review, standard temperature is 0 degrees Celsius or 273 Kelvin and pressure is 1 atm or 101.3 whoops kpa all right so s is for solid L is for liquid, G is for gas. There is also a fourth state of matter called plasma, which is ionized gas, and we don't discuss that in regions chemistry. We're only concerned with solid liquid gas. And then a lot of times, most of the solutions that we talk about are in the aqueous form, which is a solid that's been dissolved in water and this is a state of matter, but not a phase of matter. Okay. Let's look at these three different phases of matter. First, let's look at a gas. Gas particles tend to spread out as far as they can. And if we were to look at this, under a microscope, you can see that there's a lot of space between them. In a liquid, particles are closer together, but they're still able to move past one another. And in a solid, particles are so close together that they only have the ability to vibrate in place. Okay, let's review the different properties of these different phases of matter. Solid has a definite shape, it has a definite volume, and the particles vibrate about a fixed point. It usually has high density because there's small distance between the particles. And the intermolecular forces, which we learned at, about in our last unit, are very strong at room temperature because the particles are so close together. If you were asked to draw a particle diagram, each one of these circles represents a single particle. You can see that they are arranged in a regular geometric pattern which is often the definition that is used to describe a solid. In the middle column, we have liquids. Liquids often take the shape of their container, which means that they have an indefinite shape, and they have a definite volume. They also vibrate but they vibrate about moving points, meaning that the particles are not quite as close together as they are in a solid, but definitely closer together than they are in a gas, so that they can move past one another. They also have high density because there's small distance between the particles, and their intermolecular forces, meaning the forces between the molecules, are usually strong. This would be the particle diagram representing a liquid. And then gases have an indefinite shape, and they also have an indefinite volume. Indefinite shape and indefinite volume. They are free to move all over the place. They have a low density because if there's big gaps of distance between the particles, which means that their intermolecular forces are generally weak because the particles are f spread so far out. And this would be the example of a gas particle diagram. Another word that I want to introduce here 
and we may have mentioned it before, is the word entropy. Entropy means randomness. So when we think about solids, liquids, and gases, the phase that has the most randomness would be gases. So gases have greater entropy than liquids, which are greater than solids. So okay, let's take a look at a phase diagram. A phase diagram is used to show us the transition between different phases of matter. This one shows us the difference, um, the phases between solid, liquid, and gas. Some of them might just show solid and liquid. Some of them might show liquid and gas. Temperature is always on the y-axis. And time is on the x-axis. So time is usually measured in minutes down here. Heat is also added. Now, we're going to learn a couple of things this year in which we use the words endothermic and exothermic, which we've already discussed in a previous unit. Let's recall over here that endothermic is when energy is absorbed. And exothermic is when energy is released. And I want you to think about any time where you've ever held a snowball or a piece of ice in your hand. What's happened? If you hold a snowball in your bare hand or a piece of ice, what's going to happen? It's going to melt. Why is it going to melt? Well, think about it. Visualize the snowball or the ice in your hand. Remember heat travels from an area or a body of higher temp to a body of lower temp. Your hand is warmer than the ice cube. So heat is transferred from your hand to the ice. The ice absorbs the heat from your hand. Thus, as it's absorbing heat, it melts from a solid to a liquid. If you hold it long enough, your hand will become very, very cold because all of the heat will be drawn out of your hand by the substance that has a lower temperature. So that's what's going on here. As you can see, as heat is added, a substance will transition from a solid to a liquid to a gas. So what I want you to remember here, this is actually a heating curve. And it is endothermic because energy is being absorbed. Anytime you go uphill, Okay, anytime you go uphill, you need energy to do it. So we're going uphill from solid to liquid to gas. Now, a couple of things that I want to talk about before we move on on this diagram. At points A, C, and E, there is a change in temperature here, A, C, and E, there is a change in temperature. The temperature is increasing. So as T increases, kinetic energy increases. Remember that potential energy, as we discussed in the first lesson, is energy that is stored. 
So at points B and D, B and D, there is no change in T. Therefore, kinetic energy is constant, but potential energy is increasing. Okay, we'll go over this again. I'm just introducing some of these things. At the phase change, we have both solid and liquid, so both phases of matter are present. And depending on whether the temperature is increasing or decreasing, either something will melt or freeze. At D, we have both phases, liquid and gas, present. And if the temperature is increasing, then it will vaporize and turn into a gas. The temperature happens to be decreasing. It will condense. So let's review all these. Liquid is the phase of matter characterized by its constituent particles appearing to vibrate about moving points. Substances can move past, the particles can move past one another. Evaporation is the process by which the surface particles of liquids escape into the vapor state. So this is a phase change. Evaporation is a phase change from liquid to gas. Can a liquid evaporate if its temperature is below its normal boiling point? Well, because we think when something boils, okay, the atmospheric pressure is equal to the vapor pressure the substance boils. It transfers from a liquid phase to a gas phase. But can it evaporate below the boiling point? Evaporation occurs at any temperature. Okay, so the answer is yes. Okay, evaporation occurs at any temperature. And that's because particles are still randomly moving. If we increase the temperature, they're going to be moving faster. So evaporation will increase. OK. To look at the next part in the notes, you need to open up your reference tables and turn to table H. I've copied it here, but it would be easier if you could pause me for a second and open up your reference tables to table H. Okay. Table H is our vapor pressure of four liquids. And we can see what happens to the boiling point of a substance as we change the vapor pressure. So vapor pressure is defined as the upward pressure exerted by a vapor in equilibrium with its liquid. The boiling point of a substance is when the atmospheric pressure equals the vapor pressure. So all of these substances have a boiling point. Let's talk, let's first look at water. Here is standard pressure, 101.3 kPa, or one atmosphere, but this table happens to be in kPa. And let's look at water. At 101.3 kPa, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. Okay. Now let's look at propanone. At 101.3 kPa, water boils at 55 degrees Celsius. So what can we say about the difference between water and propanone? Well, first of all, you're not really familiar with what propanone is because we haven't discussed the organic chemistry unit yet. 
Propanone is a ketone, okay? And not that you need to know this now, but if I were to draw it out, um, it's a, a chain of three carbons with a double bonded oxygen on the middle carbon. So this is propanone. And of course, you know what water looks like. Here's my water molecule. Let me put my valence electrons on this one. Okay. So propanone has a lower boiling point than water. Why? Let's think about some things that we learned in the last unit. Well, first of all, we know that water has hydrogen bonding between molecules, which is one of the strongest of the intermolecular forces when we think about hydrogen bonding, LDFs, and dipole. So stronger forces equals higher boiling point. So we can say by looking at this chart right off the bat, I'm going to abbreviate boiling point BP, that water has stronger forces than propanone because it has a higher boiling point. Now, looking at ethanoic acid, okay, ethanoic acid has even a higher boiling point than water. This is what ethanoic acid looks like. It's a double bonded oxygen, okay? So this is your double bonded oxygen here. And you also have H bonding. Okay, there we go. So this also has H bonding and it's a bigger molecule. So again, stronger forces. Now where does this leave us with our question? Okay. It says, what happens if the vapor pressure of a liquid is equal to the atmospheric pressure? Well, I just explained all of that, and boiling occurs. Okay, let's talk about solid. Solid, the phase of matter characterized by particles that appear to vibrate about fixed points. As the temperature of a liquid is lowered, the forces of attraction between the particles become stronger. Why? Because as the temperature decreases, particle motion slows down. Particles become closer together. The closer they are, the stronger the attractive forces. The attractive forces arrange particles in an orderly fashion. The motion of the particles becomes severely restricted and particles vibrate in place. The temperature at which the substance becomes a solid is its melting point or freezing point. All true solids have a structure called a crystal lattice. So here is a crystal lattice structure. Let's look at one for diamond as well. This is similar to the structure that you've seen in my room, the black network solid that we call diamond. So let's take a more in-depth look at a heating curve. We're going to first look at a heating curve and then cooling curve. If you know one, you really know the other because they're actually opposites. Heating curves is temperature versus time while a substance is heated at a constant rate. Again, temperature is on the y-axis always. Time is on the x-axis. 
This shows us the transition from a solid to a liquid to a gas. Remember that at points A, C, and E, what is changing? Hopefully you said kinetic energy. At points B and C, where temperature is not changing, what is changing? Potential energy. Okay, so in your notes, it says section A, and it's lettered A through E. I'm going to show you this, and I'm going to come back to this diagram. Then it says the number of phases and the name. So when we look at line segment A, or section A on the graph, they want to know how many phases are present here. So if I look at section A, there's only one phase one phase. So this is going to be one and that phase is solid. Is there a change in temperature? I'm just going back and forth for this first one. Is there a change in temperature? Yes, there is a change in temperature. So this is yes. The temperature is increasing. So is there a change in kinetic energy? Yes. And because this is a heating curve, and temperature is increasing, kinetic energy is increasing. Is there a change in potential energy at this section? No, there is not, because we are not at a plateau. Okay, so for B, I'm going to write on the graph, and you can write into your chart. In section B, how many phases do we have present? Well, we have two phases. Okay, two phases, solid and liquid, solid and liquid. Is there a change in temperature? No. So right here, there is no change, okay, no change in T. You're filling that in in your chart. Is kinetic energy changing? No, kinetic energy is not changing. What about potential energy? Is potential energy changing? Yes, it is. So at this line segment, potential energy is changing and it's increasing. Because this is a heating curve, energy is being absorbed, okay? Potential energy is increasing. What about C? How many phases do I have at C? I have one phase. It's the liquid phase. There is a change in temperature, so there is a change in T, and if there's a change in T, then that means that there is a change in kinetic energy, and kinetic energy is increasing because temperature is increasing. There is no change in potential energy at this point in time. At section D, we have two phases. We have liquid and we have gas. Is there a change in T? No, there is no change in T. There is no change in kinetic energy and PE is increasing. And in our last section, I'll go to the chart in E, you should have been filling this in. We have one phase. It is a gas. There is a change in temperature. And there is a change in kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is increasing. And there is no change in potential energy. Let's look at cooling curve. Cooling curve is opposite of a heating curve. Temperature versus timed and now we're going downhill. So we're going from a gas to a liquid to a solid. So cooling curves are exothermic energy is being released 
during these processes. So again, you're filling in your chart at AB, okay, I have one phase. It is a gas, so this is one gas. There is a change in kinetic energy, I mean, sorry, change in T. So we have a change in T. Temperature is decreasing. Therefore, we have a change in Ke. Ke is decreasing and there is no change in potential energy. So let me go to the chart. AB was gas. There was a change in T. It was decreasing. Kinetic energy, there is a change in kinetic energy. Ke is also decreasing. And there is no change in potential. Two. I'm between two phases, this is gas and liquid in equilibrium here at BC. Okay, gas, liquid, equilibrium. So we're at a plateau. So we have two phases. We have gas and we have liquid. There is no change in temperature which means that there is no change in kinetic energy. There is a change in potential energy, and it's a downhill curve, so energy is being released. So potential energy is actually decreasing. In CD, we have the liquid phase and there's a temperature change. So we have one phase, it is liquid. There is a change in temperature, it is decreasing, which means that there is a change in kinetic energy, it is decreasing, and potential energy is not changing. In E, D, E, we're going from liquid to solid. Both phases are in equilibrium. There is no change in temperature. So we have two phases present, liquid and solid. There is no change in temperature, no change in kinetic energy. There is a change in potential energy, and we know that it is decreasing. And the last phase, whoops, is solid, E to F, there is a change in temperature. So one solid, there is a change in temperature, it is decreasing, there is a change in kinetic energy, it is also decreasing and there is no change in potential energy. So this is where we're going to stop today. Tomorrow we'll talk a little bit more about phase changes and then we're going to begin to talk about calculating the energy associated with phase changes.